Okay, so this is uh, part three of a series of messages uh, that are on the topic of stewardship or giving. So uh, I say that, and I know there's several visitors here this morning. This is something we don't normally do. We don't, we're not a church that talks about money a lot. But the Lord is speaking through us a lot lately about, not about our finances, but about our heart. And we're seeing from scriptures that when our heart is with God, everything's with God. I just told Pastor Bill, he was sharing those things about the Lord owns everything. I said, man, you're, you're preaching my sermon already. I didn't even get to it yet. But if God owns everything, then he owns our money as well. So we're in, the, in, this, in this process right now for the last several years, in case you don't know, those of you that are new today, uh, we're, we're very seriously raising money to build a new facility. Not a mega church by any means, but a church that's more conducive to what we want to do as far as having more seating, better classrooms, a larger fellowship hall, a nice big kitchen, and so on and so forth. Uh, so the messages are, that I'm preaching on are getting us ready for um, the, the uh, pledge cards that we'll be asking for, I believe in May of this year, to make another three-year commitment like we did three years ago to contribute faithfully to our building campaign as we go forward with this. Brian, I was looking for you. I, this has nothing to do with the sermon, but since we're recognizing people, I wanted to recognize your, your inventions and your Cathware uh, invention that has gotten national, actually international attention. So if you don't know what that is, it's, it's, it's medical clothing, and Brian is a nurse that designed this, and uh, it's made a, an impact nationwide. So I just want to, want to recognize you, Brian. <laughs> Whoever would have thought the Lord would use you to design that? <laughs> If you don't, you have to look it up. Cathware, C-A-T-H-W-E-A-R. Look it up online. You'll see all about it. It's a wonderful, wonderful invention. It's all for Jesus. It's all for Jesus. That's right. So anyway, so we're talking about finances, but we're talking about our heart. Our, our, our beginning text is uh, Matthew 6, verses 19 through 21. So let's read that. But Jesus said, he said, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where rust and moth will destroy, or thieves could come in and steal. Don't do that. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where rust and moth can't destroy, and where thieves cannot come in to steal. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Father, I just pray, Lord, your blessing over this sermon. Lord God, uh, may it bring life and hope to us. May it bring uh, insights into your word, that you want us to step into now and live out in our lives. Lord, we pray that in the process, you will absolutely be glorified and pleased with the message. And Lord, that your people will be challenged and edified and encouraged at the same time. Let it all work together, Lord, for something great for the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So this is part three. We, already we learned that it's important to give of our finances. Giving is very closely related to faith and trust in God. As we give to the Lord, he will take care of our needs as well. We talked about the best reason to give is not out of guilt or even out of a need. But it's, it's a, it's the best way to give is to think of it as an act of worship before the Lord. And so we worship with our giving. And he challenges us to do it his way and to see what will happen. We talked about from Luke chapter 6, where the Lord said, give your love away, give your mercy away, give your forgiveness away. If someone hits your cheek, give them the other cheek. Give your belongings away, give your finances away. Give it all away and see how God will give back to you, measure for measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will, will flow out of your heart. We saw that in 2 Corinthians 9 that there's a principle of sowing and reaping. If we sow a little bit, we'll reap a little bit. If we sow a lot, we'll receive a lot back from the Lord. And so th these messages, are, I, I just want to be clear. It's a matter of the heart. It's not a matter of the money. It's a matter of the heart. So when we look at these, these scriptures, Matthew 6, let's just go through this quickly. Jesus is saying... Uh, don't build up or don't lay up for your tre don't, don't wait, lay up treasures here on earth. What is he talking about? Well, certainly we have to live somewhere. 
We have to drive, drive a car to go places. We have to have money to do things. He's not saying that. He's saying don't build up your kingdom on earth. And this is the greatest counterculture revolutionary ever that ever lived. Jesus is preaching against the culture then as well as now. Because in the world, everyone says, do it now. Build yourself up. Get more, 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 more. There used to be this, this uh, phrase out a few years ago. The one with uh, the most toys wins. Which is such a lie. But, but that's the way of the world. Jesus is saying, don't go that way. Because you know, rust and moth will destroy. The things you have can be destroyed. I would say nowadays, the things we have could be destroyed by fire and flood. That's happening all over the place. But thieves could steal, things could happen, and you can't take it with you. So instead of doing that, lay up for yourselves, what? Treasures in heaven. Well, what's treasures in heaven? It's got to be a spiritual thing. It's got to be something that has a spiritual connotation to it. Um, some, so when you, do, when you lay up treasures in heaven, uh, those treasures cannot be destroyed or taken away or stolen. So he's saying invest in God's work now on earth. It's like, if you could catch what I'm saying, it's like money in the bank later. We're giving now and it'll have eternal consequences later. So our good deeds, our resources, our material goods, our finances, we give it all to the Lord that have eternal consequences. Now, when I got saved, I didn't know all this, by the way. I didn't know that that was expected of me. I was still under the mindset, I'm going to build my kingdom. But then I got saved and, and learned along the way, I've got to build his kingdom. And as I build his kingdom, the, to the best of my ability, he blesses me and more than abundantly takes care of me. So then he says in verse 21, this, where your treasure is, this is where your heart is. So we need to ask, what's the most important thing in our lives? So we look and see, what have we invested in? What have we given our finances to? What have we given our time and energy to? If we've given it for the world, our heart is in the world. If we've given it for the Lord and for the church, our heart is in the kingdom of God. Look in chapter 6, just real quickly. In verse 20, uh, 20, uh, 24, he says, you can't serve two masters. You can't be in the world and in the, in, the, in the Lord at the same time. It's either one or the other. He goes on to say, if you scan down, verse 31 says, don't worry, what shall you eat, what shall you drink, or what shall you wear? For your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But verse 33 says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these things will be added to you. So he's laying down some very important principles about giving and, and being a generous person. I remember, you know, learning about being generous. First of all, I learned how God was generous to me. I learned that his mercy is new every single morning. Think about it. He never runs out of mercy. He never runs out of love. He never runs out of forgiveness. And I don't know about you, but I don't deserve his forgiveness most of the time. Any, any time. But he gives and gives and gives. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave. So when we have a generous heart, a generous spirit, we're imitating the God that we serve. It's godly to be a generous person. And I don't only mean with money, I mean with everything. So I, I remember, um, Pamela, I don't know if you remember this, but we were newly saved and maybe a year or so in, into our salvation. And... Uh, we learned about tithing down in North Carolina. And, I, you know, I don't know if I was there yet, the 10%, but I was close to it, if not there. And I, everything was okay, and, you know, I was working, and I think, Stacy, you might have been a little baby at that time. And so that one Sunday, there was a, a missionary that came, and the missionary spoke. And um, after he finished, the, you know, I, I enjoyed it. The pastor came up and said, okay, now we're going to receive the second offering. Never heard of that phrase I was just getting used to the tithe, which I already gave my tithe in the offering. Now he says, well, we're going to have a second offering. I'm saying, well, what's a second offering? A second offering? I gave my offering. He goes, well, we want to, we want to bless the missionary, and, you know, he has some needs. He's got to get money to go back or whatever. And I said, oh, and I knew I had a $20 bill in my wallet. And I, you know, the, the, the 1980s, $20 was more than it is now. So I had this $20 bill. I didn't have two fives and a 10. I didn't have two tens. I had a 120. I couldn't get changed because it wasn't appropriate to get change. 
And so I, I'm thinking about it. I look at my wife. I show her the 20. She goes like that. I said, really? Yeah. Then I started to sweat. Because the prayer was said, the ushers are getting ready to come. i got to make a decision here. And I don't want to be embarrassed. And I want to do the right thing. Should I? Or should, and I'm you know, debating. Lord, and finally I felt a nudge. Just, just do it. Just give the $20. But, which left me for nothing for the week. And in those days, that was a big deal, actually. you know. But I gave it. And I'll tell you, at that moment, I felt liberated that money had no hold on me. And, uh, and I've kept that attitude through the whole time. But the Lord loves uh, a generous, happy, you know, giver that will just give as much as you can for the kingdom of God. It, it is like, I, I use the phrase money in the bank. I hope you know what I mean. It's like we're investing in the place that we're going to anyway. So our reservation is there already. We're just investing in that heavenly place where we're going to. So... Okay, so the name of the sermon today is A Practical, practical Guide for Generous Giving. Uh, most of the information came from a, a Dr. Hood uh, who gave us information three years ago when this whole thing started about raising money for the Thrive Campaign. By the way, in 2015, the giving increased in our church by 298%. That's a lot of increase. And every year since then, it's been increasing on the 298. I mean, Stacy and I, is, and Pastor, we can remember the days not too long ago when every month we were counting the pennies to make sure we were going to make it. And then all of a sudden, man, things started to change and people got a, a kingdom mentality, started to tithe and give. And uh, not that we're there yet. I mean, we have a big project on our hands, you know, but, but we have some good principles already. So, okay, so our goal today... Is, is, to, um, is to help us, remember a few weeks ago I shared some statistics that 20% of the people will, will give uh, 80% of the church budget, you know, nationwide. Another 30% will give the other 20%, and then 50% won't give anything to the budget. But we're trying to reverse that and, and help everyone begin to trust God with whatever you have, whatever finances you have, and to work towards that 10% mark or above to give to the Lord. Now, I know, as I say, Rome wasn't built in a day. So some of us, like me, I needed time to get to that point. But I finally got to that point, and I see the, the benefit of it. I want you to remember that giving is an act of worship. Matthew 6.33. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. In the kingdom, there's so many principles. Moral principles. How to, be, how to live morally. How to live with your family. How to conduct family business. How to live as a, as a businessman or a business worker. Um, and then there's financial principles. But as we seek God first and his righteousness, all these other things will be added to us. And so we're, we're investing in the kingdom of God and we're investing in the Lord's work. Okay, so there's three things to think about, and I, and I want to, this is from this other person, Dr. Hood, but I've kind of embellished upon them to make them relative to where, where we are. The first point is this. In order to be a, a generous giver, we've got to start thinking like a godly servant. Now, that might be hard for some of us to think about because maybe we're not living right or we don't feel right or we come from a bad place, a bad background or whatever. We don't feel like we're a servant of the Most High God. If, if that's you, try to, try to put that out of your mind for a minute and look at what God calls you. God calls you redeemed. He calls you and I beloved. He calls us, he calls us his sons and his daughters. So we have to start thinking we're a child of the king. We're no longer a child of the world or of the flesh even. We're a child of the king of kings and lord of lords. So we have to start thinking that way. Thinking about it really is really very important. Acts 16, just a little verse there that says uh, th this, this uh, young girl who was uh, used in divination actually, she sees Paul and his team coming and she, says, she blurts out, these men uh, are servants of the most high God. They're proclaiming the way of salvation. And that's what we are. We are servants of the Most High God, proclaiming the way of salvation. Can I get an amen right there? Because we, we may forget who we are and what we're all about. We are servants of God's, proclaiming to the world around us the way of salvation. I shared on Friday night, uh, as our business meeting started, a short devotional from Matthew 10, that Jesus sent out his 
to his apostles. And he sends us out all the time to be a witness for him in these days. So a couple of things here. Uh, we have to remember that God owns everything and reserves the right to bless his people. God owns everything. He allows us, he invites us to be a part of what he's doing. I think I shared this a couple of weeks ago. I forget where it was. But we used to pray all the time, Lord, I, I accept you, Jesus, as my Lord, my Savior, and the master of my life. Anyone ever remember that prayer? We don't pray that way too much anymore, but we should. He's our Lord, he's our Savior, and he's the master. A lot of people just want a Savior because we get in trouble or whatever. But he is our Lord and our Savior and our master. We are his servants. So he owns everything. He is in charge of everything. Can I just proclaim that? That God is God. We are his servants. This is a big deal. And how do we get to be his servant? We can't just say well, one day, well, I'm going to be a servant of the Lord. Man, it, it takes repentance. It takes turning away and believing in the cross, applying the blood over our lives. Then we become a servant of his. Not everyone can, well, any, everyone can be a servant, but it takes someone that's willing to say, you're God and I'm not. And that's the rub right there. So many people want to be God themselves. They want to be in charge of their lives, and we can't. So we, we accept God as God, and we are his servants. A couple of scriptures, Psalm 50. It says, every beast of the forest is mine. Think about it. I own the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, all the wild beasts of the field. They are mine, says the Lord. Think about it. Amen. Psalm 121. David, I lift my eyes up to the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the God who made heaven and earth. My help comes from the God who made those hills over there. I'm a servant of the Most High God. Acts 17, Paul was in Athens looking around and seeing all these statues of these foreign gods that they worshipped. And there was one statue that said, this is, a, this is a statue of the unknown God. And Paul capitalizes on that opportunity. He begins to preach Jesus to them from this, from this statue. He said, this God that I'm preaching to you, he's the one that gives to all life and breath and hope. He gives all things to all people. It's in him that we live and move and have our being." So let's get that straight. We are servants of God's. He owns everything that we have. And secondly, knowing that gives us balance in life. I shared another scripture on, at, at the business meeting the other night. Psalm, Psalm 112, I think it was verse uh, 7, I believe it was. It says that a righteous person, uh, when, when a righteous person receives bad news, they're steadfast. And I thought about that because there's been some bad news, some difficult news many of us have had over the holidays. But when a, a righteous person, someone covered by the blood of Christ, gets bad news, they're not shaken. There's balance. You, you can almost say, like Romans 8, 28, all things work together. It doesn't matter what happens. I mean, it matters, but it doesn't matter. You know, it matters in the sense we may have to make some adjustments. But in the big picture, if we belong to God, God has us. So whatever comes our way, it's going to be all right. So Paul says in Philippians 4, I've learned that whatever condition I'm in, whatever, wherever I am in life, whether I'm abased or I abound, whether I'm in jail or out, whether I'm rich or poor, or healthy or sick, whatever, I get good news or bad news, I've learned to be content in all things. Because in, in this relationship, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So that's why, like, like, when things happen, you know, I mean, early on in my Christian walk, I, I would fall apart over things. But at this point in my life, I realized, wait a minute. I'm going to touch, I'm, I'm touched by God. He, God owns me. I've given him my, I didn't take my life back. I don't want to take my life back. But if I've given God my life, can I trust him with my life? He, he, he's God, I'm his servant. He's not going to turn his back on me. And, and, and that Psalm 112 about bad news, you know, some people say, bad news, you should never get bad news as a Christian. I'll say, man, I don't know what kind of life you live. If that's your life, good, good for you. That's not my life. I deal with bad news a lot. Try being a pastor for a couple of days. You'll get some bad news. <laughs> you know? But, but well, regardless, we, we've learned to be content. We know that, that God, God takes care of us. 
uh, First Chronicles, David said this, Both riches and honor come from you, and you reign over all. In your hand is power and might. In your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. So knowing all this, going back to what Pastor Bill said, stealing my thunder, <laughs> knowing all that, this is not my body. Our, your body is not your body. Your body belongs to God. It's his body. He gave it to you. He, your talents, your giftings are not yours or mine. They're his. Our successes in life are not ours. They're his successes. Let me get personal. Your car is not your car. Some of you said, hallelujah, I don't want that car anyway. But <laughs> your house, your belongings, your money, it's yours, but it's not yours. If you're a servant of God, he's taking care of you. It, it is yours, but it's really his. So as we think like a godly servant, we're thinking everything belongs to the Lord. I, I, I belong to him. And what I do with my money is important. So let me give you some practical advice. Because it's, you know, we're talking about the heart. Okay, as a servant of God, we have to ask ourselves a question. What are we doing with our money? Now, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. However, sometimes the pastor has to put some things out here. So I don't know where this is going to fall. But in my life, I, I learned early on, if I want to have money to do stuff for the kingdom of God and do stuff for my lovely wife and my family, which I want to do, I've got to stop spending money on other things. Like alcohol. As a servant of God, should I be buying alcohol? Should I be buying street drugs, even legal drugs now, that are going to upset my mind or change my mind? This kind of takes away from the fact that I'm a servant of the Most High. See, if I, if I alter my mind, I'm not trusting him to renew my mind. I'm trusting in other things to renew my mind. Should I put money into that when I could go to him for that? You see what I mean? So, so should I go to ungodly entertainment, right? Should I do things that are, you know, uh, is it going to hurt my spirit? And the answer is no. And I just saved you a ton of money by doing that. So now that you got all this money, what are you going to do with all this money? See, as a servant of the Most High God, we have to start thinking that way. Like, what do I do with my money? I, 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 I have a pretty good handle on my money right now, don't I, Pamela? <laughs> but, but anyway, it's important to think about what, what are we doing with our money? Think like a godly servant. Think like a godly servant. Okay, number two is this. Because thinking about it's one thing. Doing it's another thing, right? So we have to act like a trusted manager. We have to manage our money, manage our finances, manage our resources, manage what God blesses us with, whether it's a lot or a little. Don't wait till you have a lot. Wherever you are, that's what you have. That's it. You have to manage what God has blessed you with. So our thinking goes into acting. Back to Matthew 6, uh, Jesus is saying, put your treasure in the right place. Act like a good manager and a good steward of your finances. Put it in things that will last forever. So I, I, I remember, and I, maybe I shared this story with you, but uh, you know, back in the day before I was a Christian, when Pamela used to come see the guitar player in the clubs, uh, <laughs> anyway, we, we had another missionary. We had, an <laughs> we had, a, we had another, uh, okay, at, at this point we were at church in Greenwich, Connecticut, wasn't in the ministry yet. I was just attending. And there was another missionary that had what's called like a 10-minute window to share his heart in the service. And this missionary, uh, actually he was from, I think he was from Kenya. He came, he shared his heart. He was in the States trying to raise money and get resources to take back with him to Kenya. So he shared what he needed, and I think he was starting a school or something. But he said, I need a bass guitar and I need a PA system. And when he said that, I said, oh, I, got, I think I got that in my basement. From the old days, when I used to take it into the clubs, I stored it away after I got saved and lugged it around everywhere we moved in different states and everything. But, but I realized, okay, this brother's asking for, for something. So I dug it out, nice guitar, bass guitar, little PA system, you know, not, not big, but it was strong. And I gladly, I, I was so happy to give that stuff away. And I realized after that, I mean, I didn't expect anything in return. I, and I didn't get anything in return in that regard. But God has blessed uh, my music ministry and, and guitar playing and all that stuff and, and worshiping. 
And God has blessed my relationship with many African countries over the years. I think there's something about pouring into that that God gets, gets, uh, gives a blessing back to us as a result of that. So I, I had to manage my, my resources, and it wasn't money, it was, it was material things. Um, but I'm, I was glad to give it away. Uh, where are we here? Okay, turn with me to 1, uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Is it relatively quiet in here or is it my imagination? Everyone's thinking, everyone's good. As long as no one's sleeping, I'm happy. <laughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2. Verse 1, I see something I haven't seen before. But verse 1 says, Concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, so you must do also. I never really focus on the word must right there, but you know what? I see it. Now, this isn't pertaining to your salvation, right? It's pertaining to your involvement in the church. It's pertaining to how you relate to, to people, to God, how obedient you are to give to the cause of Christ. Because giving to the cause of Christ is the biggest thing we can do. So he's saying you must do this. So he says a couple of things in verse number two. I just want to highlight this. He says, on the first day of the week. So what he's saying is, reading you know, into it a little bit, give regularly on the first day of the week when you all meet together. In other words, give it systematically. And he says, let each one of you, not the 20, you know, the 20, 30 percent, but the 100 percent of everyone should be giving something. Each one gives something to the cause. And then he says, uh, lay something aside. Uh, so, so plan for this. Don't just be caught off guard, and, but be, be planning to give every week. And um, it says at the end there, uh, storing up as you may prosper. In other words, some will give more than others. But as you, as you earn money, as God blesses you, you give more. If you get a raise, you give more. If you get a decrease, you give less, if you want to look at it that way. But you give in proportion to what you make. But remember, the widow's might. She gave the least out of everybody, but she gave the most. So it's not always the biggest amount in dollars and cents. It's what you have to work with. It's how, that's how you judge how, how much you're giving. So we have to be really good uh, managers you know, of, of what God has given to us. So, so think like a godly servant. Act like a trusted manager. Okay, let's go to the third one. So we have to think, act. The third one is feel like a precious heir of the kingdom of God. So uh, I'm going to read Romans 8 in just a minute, but we need to feel this, this sonship or daughtership. We, I feel it during worship a lot, you know? I feel connected. I feel like I'm, I'm at one with God. The Holy Spirit's working. It feels good. I, in, in prayer time, I feel connected to God. But we have to also feel this connection as we're giving our offering to the Lord. You know, last Sunday morning... We had a, about 40, 50 people here, I think it was, during the snowstorm. But there were some testimonies. Wayne, you shared a testimony. I want you to share it next week. But Wayne made a statement. I don't know that I ever heard anyone articulate this before. He said, I can't wait to go to church on Sunday to give my tithe. Remember you said that? I said, man, that is wonderful. No wonder why God's blessing you. Because your heart, your heart is right. And so there's something about feeling connected. As he's giving the offering, he's feeling connected. Amen. It's not just, you know, sitting there, hallelujah, hallelujah. Now it's like literally, literally putting your money where your mouth is and giving your finances, and it makes us feel connected as an heir to God. In other words, we're obedient. We're, we're, we're connected not only in heart. We're connected with our finances, our, our blessings. It's, a, it's a, another way to, to feel that, that sonship. Okay, Romans 8 says this. You did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. I think we sang this earlier. We're, we're uh, a child of God. Not, not a bondage again to fear. You have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. I have to tell you, when I gave that $20 for that missionary, I felt connected. I felt like I was sowing into something way bigger than myself. And so even now, as I give to 
I give to our missionaries now, I, you know, the things that I do, it makes me feel connected in a different sort of a way than when I worship. So we're going to talk about Matthew 25 just a minute. We won't turn to it. Let me just tell you the story. The parable of the talents. Great parable. Wonderful parable. Here it is. The master had three servants. The master was going to go away on a long trip, and he gave the servants some talents, which is money. He gave them money. One servant he gave five talents to. One he gave two talents to. One he gave one to. And he said, I'm going to go away. I'm, giving, I'm entrusting this to you. When I come back, I want to settle accounts with you. And I've given to you according to your ability. That's like saying today, some of us have more than others because of our ability or whatever. But some, one had five, one had two, and one had one. So the man went away, and after a long time, it says he came back. And when he came back, he went to the one that he gave five talents to. And he said, well, what did you do with the five talents? And the guy said, well, I invested. I, got, I made five more. And the master said, he was really happy. He said, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little bit. You're going to be ruler over many things. Enter into my rest. The guy was blessed. He was blessed. So the other guy had two talents. So he had less than the five. But you know, it, to him, it was just as much, if you th think of it that way. And so the man came back and said, so what did you do with your two talents? And the man said, well, I invested. I made two more. And the man said the same thing to that one. He said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You did good with a little bit. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter into my rest. Then he went to the one with the one. And he said, well, what did you do with the one that I gave you? He said, I dug a hole and I buried it. And he went berserk. <laughs> you did what? You didn't invest? You have nothing to show for it? He said, I was afraid to do anything with it. And the master was not only mad, he, he took the, the, the talent and kicked him out and said, get away from me. Go where there's gnashing of teeth. And so that's like us saying, we're blessed with so much and we don't invest into the kingdom of God. That's like a slap in the face to God. He's saying, look, I've given you something, whether a lot or a little, you got something. Can you not invest into what I'm doing here? And if not, you know, he says, I don't even want to see you. This is a serious thing. So we got to feel that, that sonship, that daughtership with God. I mean, like, like he, he saved us. You know, we always have this, this concept, you know, it's, salvation is free. It is free. All you have to do is believe and, and receive. However, to stay connected to God, it will definitely cost us our lives. We can't live the old way anymore and expect to be right with God. You know, we, we have to live for God, and he wants all of us. So he's saying, you know, you have to, you have to feel like an heir to the kingdom. And, and one way of doing that, it isn't the, isn't the Lord knowledgeable that we could say it all the time. Oh, I'm a child of God. I'm a child. I worship God five hours a day. I read my Bible. I could quote you scriptures. How come it hurts so much when we give out of our, out of our pocket or our wallet or pocketbook? It hurts in a different way when we give it tangibly. You ask me if I'm a child of God now. Well, I don't know if I'm, if I'm that much of a child of God. But see, when we break through that and just give it out there, it demonstrates to God and to ourselves and to others, we, we belong to a higher authority. His name is Jesus. Amen. So here, here's the point. Um, we need to invest uh, in eternal things. We need to invest in the place of our eternal destiny. I love this concept. We already have a reservation for us. We're investing in the place that we're going to. Isn't that cool? This is not, this is not you know, brain science here. This is, like, this is like basic. But we're investing in the place that God has already reserved a place for us to be at. So why would we want to invest in that place? Kingdom of God. Okay, so does God need our money? No, he doesn't really need our money. But he asks us to participate. He asks us to partner with him. He asks us to invest with him. And he uses that to advance his kingdom. So let me go back to Matthew 6. I just want to mention this quickly. And then I'm going to call Bruce up here in just a few minutes. But Matthew 6 says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. There's two examples. One is the, widow's, the widow and the widow's might. Right? Jesus was observing how, how they were receiving the offering one day. He was out, out at the temple. He said to his disciples, watch this. Look how these guys are given. Some are giving a lot of money with a lot of fanfare. 
which means nothing to the Lord. But here comes this little old woman with the two pieces of coins, and she puts in her offering. And Jesus nudges them and says, look at that lady. See that lady? She gave more than everybody. They gave out of their abundance. She gave out of her need. So if you're a poor person, whatever you do for God, he appreciates what you do. But being poor doesn't exempt you from giving either. There's got to be something that you give toward God. The other scripture is uh, 1 Timothy 6. We don't have time to get into it. But Paul's telling Timothy to address the rich people in the, in the congregation. I find that interesting. He said, to the rich men, you can look it up later. To the rich men, tell them, don't trust in your riches. Just because you have money, you still need to trust in God. And as you trust in God, be willing to give your money away to help other people. Because this will give you a foundation grounded in eternal life. So whether you're rich or you're poor, he's saying you have to give and invest into the kingdom of God. So Malachi 3, you know this. The Lord said, give, my, give your tithes and offering. Test me in this. Test me. See if I'm going to pour out blessings on you. You won't even be able to contain them. Luke chapter 6, give everything away. Give your life, your heart, your, your love. Give your finances. You know, give it all away and see how I will give back to you. Measure for measure, pressed down and running over, over overflowing out of your heart. Second uh, Corinthians 9, when you invest a lot into the kingdom, God will give you a lot back, a bountiful blessing back. So having said all that, okay, so act like a trusted manager. Uh, feel like a... Uh, feel like a <laughs> precious, precious heir to the kingdom of God. So the last couple of years, um, in case you didn't hear the beginning of all this, these messages that I'm preaching, these four messages, there's one more to go, were first preached th three and a half years ago. They're a little bit different. I re reworked them. But that was the beginning of our Thrive campaign. That's when the giving increased by 298%. Talk about the power of the preaching word, the preached word of God. The word of God changed our lives. It changed the history of this church. So for three years, or th three and a half years now, we've been, we've been talking about this, uh, raising money for it. But at our annual business meeting on Friday, um, Bruce Squibb, who was uh, the overseer of the Thrive Campaign, gave a great report. So I'm going to ask you, Bruce, come at this time and, uh, and give the